哦，那我呃，哎，那我就直接开始介绍一下我的背景，然后就我我我我有一些 notes。其实我感觉有点紧张。<笑> so it's okay if I speak English. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, I thought maybe start. I'll talk a little bit about my background, how I got into marketing, <clears throat> how I got into marketing. Uh, and it started really when I was, I moved to the UK about nine years old. So I came to UK in 1996. So I've been in the UK more than I've been in China most of my life. I'm 35 now,、uh, which is why I think my Chinese is a bit rusty, especially when it comes to like business presentations or talks.、Uh, and I think a lot of people, maybe you guys will see this as well. When you speak different languages, you have different personalities sometimes. So when I speak Chinese, my personality is very different to when I speak English.、Uh, I think it must be something to do with confidence.、But、when I speak English, I can talk for hours and hours and hours. That you literally can't stop me from talking.、Um, when I speak Chinese, I get really nervous and my sentences become very short. I think because I lack the ability to articulate my thoughts into my my ideas into Chinese specifically. But anyway, I'm digressing.、Um, I grew up.、Uh, I remember when I first came to the UK and I saw the first computer in 1996. It was crazy. It was like a Pentium P90, which was a 90 megahertz processor. For anyone who's in technology, will know how slow that is compared to what we have now. And the internet we had was like 28.8k modem, which is incredibly slow compared to what we have now, like 500 times slower than what what it is now that we're used to.、Um, But what really fascinated me was the internet, and this was before Google, right? So we had stuff like in the UK, we had stuff internet like、uh, internet search engines like Yahoo and Ask Jeeves, all the really shitty search engines.、Uh, and I really wanted to build a website、um, because I saw some tutorials, I saw other websites,、uh, and I was also really into Dragon Ball Z. Some of you guys will know, like Chiong Zhu, which is like really famous in China and really popular in the UK back in the nineties as well. So I remember building my first website about Dragon Ball Z, about the episodes, the characters.、Uh, I learned how to write markup language HTML back then, and a little bit of CSS as well. There wasn't really much CSS back in the day; it was mostly just HTML. So I built a website. I learned how to like optimize a website for search engines. But back then, it was really easy. You just have to put loads of keywords on the web on the website, and then and then you would rank like top of like the big search engines. So it was super easy. And that's what really got me into marketing. I remember when I was about eleven, I think,、uh, after running the website for two years, it started to become really popular. I was getting like tens of thousands of page views per month, sometimes even hundred thousand. And I was putting banner on the website to earn money from like the clicks and the views from advertisers.、Uh, and that's what really got me into it. So technology was always something I'm super passionate about, even now.、Um, If you see my LinkedIn post, majority is is either about marketing or it's about technology, and I think the reason that I really got into marketing was because not just technology. When I was building the website, I also learned how to use Photoshop.、Um, back in the day, it was like Photoshop five or something crazy,、uh, and the the kind of like the aspect of creativity, the combination of creative and technology was something I really always wanted to do, and I think. A job in marketing probably the best reflection of that. Like if you are into tech, if you're into what's happening like now,、uh, what, what what the innovations are in society,、uh, in businesses,、uh, and you also want to have like a creative hands-on role, I think Mark, you can't find a better industry than marketing to do that because you always have to stay ahead of the game. You always have to know what's going on,、um, and. Just to kind of like、uh, help myself develop my skills, when I'm to university, I studied internet technologies and network security, and I learned a bit more about programming, so developing C sharp, C plus、uh, plus. And when I was at uni, so that's kind of my tech side that I started to develop even more. When I went to university, also I joined a election,、uh, so、uh, student union, right? I think in China you guys have this as well, university. Uh, and you elect your officers,、um, but in the UK, the officers who are elected gets to take a year out of study. That's why they call them sabbatical officers because you take a sabbatical year out to run the students' union with the managers, 
rather than doing it while you're studying, which is like a super amazing experience. Um, and that when I did that, I was elected the VP of, I think it was services and communications, which means I sat in the marketing office. Uh, and that's where I really learned more about traditional advertising and creative. Uh, we had a marketing director there who taught me a lot about um, how to create big ideas, how marketing is not just not about, it's not just about technology. It's not just about generating leads or conversions. It's really making people feel something. And that's something I've taken with me and that I've tried to implement a human as well is that the best marketing in the world is the ones that make you feel something. It's like irrational, it's intangible. It's almost like so great that you can't even explain it. You think back of all the great campaigns in the world, it's always something you can't explain why it's so great. And that's what I love about marketing. It's like one side you have technology that's super rational and really attributable, like however much you spend on PPC or SEO or social media paid, you can attribute back to how much revenue you generate from those spend. On the other side, you have create creative and it's so intangible, it's so unattributable. You just never know how effective it is other than the brand attribution and the brand equity you get from people remembering your ad or from remembering your creative and your big idea. And that combination of like rational and irrational of logic and creativity of the tangible and intangible is what just makes me really interested and I think most people who are ready to marketing are addicted to that idea of understanding how that works. Um, some of the stuff I learned in my previous roles, oh actually before I talk about that I want to talk about my first couple of jobs because I think it's important like so my first job out of uni I already had a lot of experience right so I built my own website, I knew how to code, uh, I had some experience in creativity as well um, but I still I still got like a really junior job uh, when straight out of uni. I remember I was on, this was, oh my God, back in the days, must have been about 12 years ago now. I remember my first job, I was paid 12,000 pounds a year before tax, which is like nothing. I was living at home, but that's, some, that's actually one of my most valuable experiences because in that job, it was a client side role, but I made friends with the agency next door. And they taught me all the basics of like PPC, SEO, social media. And that's where, even though I didn't get paid much, that's where I learned probably the most of all the fun fundamentals I needed in order to get a better job in the future. And a couple of years later, I was there for a couple of years, one and a half years, I think. I then moved to a agency side role in London where they basically did uh, just normal marketing for English clients, everything. Again, mostly PPC and SEO. My background is actually mostly performance marketing. Uh, and there I learned something very, I think even more valuable than what I learned in my first role. And when I was younger building websites, it was confidence. It was confidence in presentations, confidence in being in front of a camera and making videos. And I think that's super important, right? If you guys ever get the opportunity to be in a role where you can learn and develop your confidence, there's honestly nothing more important than that because you're going to apply that to literally every single job and you can apply that to even in life. Um, I remember at the time I was so bad on camera. Uh, I wrote the entire script and I was like reading everything. I was so dry and boring. Uh, but my MD at the time was really gave us the opportunity to, for all of us to basically speak in front of the camera about what we're passionate about. And being Chinese, I really wanted to learn Baidu SEO. So this was when Baidu was becoming like popular back in the day. Uh, this was probably about 10 years ago, uh, maybe like 11, 11 years ago now. Um, and I talked about Baidu, Baidu SEO and no one was really talking about it back then because no one cared about China like 11 years ago. Um, and it got loads of traction. And my MD at the time, we even had inquiries from people like, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Expedia.com, like an online travel site that was really popular back in the day. We got an inquiry from Expedia.com saying, hey, can you help us with Chinese SEO? We want to try and penetrate that market. My MD at the time said to me, uh, are you confident in helping our clients with this? Because I don't want to ruin our reputation. I was like, no way. I literally just researched this to make the video. I have no idea how to do by do SEO. Not to mention my Chinese is just not good enough to do that anyway. Um, but that gave me the idea. I was like, oh my God, there's clearly an opportunity out there to help Western brands to do Chinese marketing. And that's basically how we started Cumin. Um, There's a few of us. 
someone at uni that I met. Um, and also later on, Tom joined as well, um, who is still at the business now. My first co-founder has left, has gone, moved on to something else. Uh, but we all started this together and we all brought in different aspects and different advantages to the business. Um, and how we build the Cumin group. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is uh, Cumin's been around for quite a while now, 10 years, uh, and it's absolutely flown by. And the first couple of years, the first several years, I'd say, is, it, is mostly like me and everyone learning how to run a business, how to get clients, how to pitch, how to deliver good work. And I always regret not having a faster learning curve to understand that actually great businesses are all about great people. Um, you yourself can't do everything. And in fact, if you rely on yourself and don't open up and give up responsibility and empower people around you, the business will never be as big or as good as you are. And you set yourself a glass ceiling or a bamboo ceiling as people call it that you, if you, if you continue to get too involved in the details and trying to do everything and be on top of everything, uh, you just never, you just never scale the business. So, and I, I did that for the first probably five, six years or even seven years. And that was probably my biggest mistake, my biggest regret is that I always felt that as a founder and as a business owner, I had to be the best at everything. I had to get involved in every project because if I didn't do that, then why am I useful? Um, and then later on, I realized that uh, the founder and the owner and any leadership in the business, when you guys get into future roles, when you get into a leadership role, a management role, your job is less about doing the job, right? It's more about helping people around you to do a better job. So looking after the people around you and enabling them to do a better job. And no one teaches this stuff because everyone, you only get to that position normally about being really, really great at your job. Uh, let's say you're a copywriter or a designer or an account manager or whatever, right? Everything, a strategist. You initially start by learning the job, learning the trade, learning the skill. Eventually, you become so good at your job, you, you get the responsibility of having a team beneath you and looking after them and looking after the work. But when you get to that position, a lot of people feel like they still have to be on top of the work and get involved with the work, which is 100% not the case. And that's the biggest mistake I learned is that, that I made and what I've learned is that you, you, when you get to that position, you go and look after the people that are doing the job and help them to do better work on their own right without you having to be involved. So the way that we grew Cumin recently with the Cumin Group, um, we have a quite a few different departments. One is DowInsights.com. Uh, Miranda's on the call here actually, and she's helping us to manage in Dow Insights now. Uh, super successful. One is One Team Media, which is our in-house influence accounts. You, some of you might know uh, World Microphone, Shijian Microphone on Douyin, uh, and also on TikTok now as well. Uh, and also 666. So first two, Dow Insights and One Team Media were started during the pandemic actually. And during the pandemic as an agency, we lost a lot of clients because a lot of brands were holding back marketing spend during uncertain times. Uh, discretionary budget, right? The first thing you cut is marketing, which I disagree with. Uh, but the, uh, sorry, one sec. Um, but instead of like letting people go, which a lot of companies did during the pandemic, when they, a lot of agencies, when they lost business, they let people go. We thought it would be good to finally utilize people's times to create something we've always been passionate about. And I've always loved content. I've always felt that we could create our own social media channels to prove that we can do great things if clients gave us opportunity to. So we, so I met Mark. Um, he's not here at the moment. Uh, and then I met Feiyang and... Yin and Ray and loads of other great people that eventually made World Microphone what it is today. But the reason I'm saying, the, the, the reason I'm telling the story is because sometimes you have in life and in business, right? You have things that happen to you that you feel like is going to be really bad and really shit. But actually it became an opportunity for us. And if the pandemic didn't happen, and if we didn't lose our clients, we probably would have never started World Microphone. We probably would have never started One Team Media our media department, which is now our strongest department. We, we, they're doing work for people like Tencent. They're literally managing TikTok for Tencent and Alipay, some of the biggest companies in the world. If we didn't have the, those channels 
to learn about how we can make videos, how we can grow followers, how we can optimize things. If we didn't have the proof of concept to show the clients like, hey guys, we run the number one fashion channel on Douyin. We have loads of followers on TikTok. You can trust us. We would have never got those clients. Um, same as Dow Insights, right? I remember building that website. Uh, we built the website with everyone on the team, Louisa, Warren, Miranda as well. Loads of other people, Emily, I think at the time as well. We built the website in one week, in just one fucking week. We just hacked it. We were just like, you know what? Let's just build the website, put out some content and see what happens. Because we had time, again, we lost a lot of clients. And we never thought of grow to be what it is today. And uh, Miranda just sent in our message group chat earlier that we were quoted today by olympics.com and they linked to us. Now, now it's like a legitimate resource for anyone who's English speaking, who are interested in Chinese marketing, interested in Chinese insights and news from marketing tech and creative platforms. Uh, we get quoted by people like McKinsey, Bloomberg, some of the biggest news in the world. And again, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the pandemic. So whenever the second thing, the second lesson, biggest lesson that I learned is that, and I'm honestly like super grateful this happened actually, because if it weren't for the pandemic, we didn't have the opportunity of losing all our clients and having lots of time. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have created these assets. And these became some of the most important assets today as a business. Um, and also if we didn't have the great people behind them, again, none of this would happen. Uh, so that's another thing that we are super proud of in the business. Um, and oh, the final thing is 666 or Liu Liu Liu. So there's a reason we why we call it Liu 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 because uh, I remember, I think it's Tom that came up with his name. Um, there's a reason why we call it Liu 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 because um, in the UK and in the West, in America, UK, Europe, 666 is a number of the devil, right? So it's like a really negative connotation. It's kind of evil. But in China, as we all know, Liu 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 is like awesome. It's like an internet slam that when people type when they're playing like League of Legends or other games. So we wanted to demonstrate to our clients when we talk to them how much difference just three numbers can make if you understand the culture or if you don't understand the culture. Uh, and 666 is a very simple concept. It's a content creator, content curation platform where we help clients to build their own media assets. So taking what we've learned from 1T Media, and again, that's how important this pandemic was for us because A, we had one of our best years. B, we created business units that we never would have a chance to create. Influenced by 1T Media, we felt that brands, instead of using influencers, where they borrow reach every time they make a campaign, they'll pay the brand like $20,000 or $50,000, like a big influencer in China or big influencer in the West. They borrow their reach, they borrow their audience. And then the next time they have to build a campaign, they have to do the same. It's like, it's like, it's like leasing instead of like buying or instead of building your own community. So we want to give the brands the opportunity to build their own community. And it's very simple. Instead of doing the content in-house, because we can't understand every single subculture. We don't have skaters, we don't have surfers, we don't have basketball players. Instead of doing it in an agency, we use our platform to find the best creators for the brands to commission content and then build their own channel. So imagine if you're Nike, rather than building, rather than going to a basketball influencer, you can build your own basketball account. Uh, rather than going to a surfing influencer or running influencer, you can build your own running account. So, and we already have loads of great clients because all the people are, all the clients are starting to realize that influence industry is losing its traction, it's dying and it's, it's just not as strong as it used to be. And I think the shift's going to go towards brands owning their own media assets rather than borrowing rich from influencers. So that's all of our business units. And the final thing, I guess, is that I just want to talk a little bit about the most important thing I think that you need in order to get into marketing. I think a genuine interest in social media, a genuine interest. Hmm, hold on a sec. Can you guys still hear me? Uh, okay, cool. I think something just changed. Um, a genuine interest in social media and marketing is super important, and that's a given, and it's kind of obvious. But I think what's not obvious is a genuine interest in people and cultures, because marketing is downstream from culture. If, you don't, if you're not interested in culture, you, you're not going to do well in marketing. I remember one of our old creative directors, we were pitching for FIFA, a massive account for Chinese social media. And I said to him, 
you don't know anything about football. Like you're not a fan of football. How can you pitch? How can you come up with creative ideas that's going to be impactful for football fans if you don't know about football? And he just said, yeah, you're right. I don't know anything about football. Uh, I'm not a fan of football, but I, I am a fan of people. Uh, when you're a fan of people, you can generally understand how to create ideas that's going to make it, that's going to make them feel something. So I would say like, unless you are genuinely a fan of people and cultures, it doesn't matter if you work in technology or creativity. I think maybe marketing is not ideal for you. But if you are, then it doesn't matter if you don't have anything else. Uh, marketing should be something that you would really enjoy. And the other thing I think is not so obvious, again, is the ability for critical thinking and problem solving. And we try to test as much as possible when we hire people, because it really doesn't matter what you know and what you don't know. Everything else you can learn on the job. And we do our best to try and make sure we have the opportunity for people to learn by having senior people in the business that can teach and train people that come in from as graduates or doesn't have as much experience. But if you don't have critical thinking or you don't have desire to think critically about problems and try and solve problems as much as possible, it's really, really hard to learn any skill set unless you have that. And I think maybe one disadvantage that everyone has uh, is that in schools, all of us, whether it's in China or in the West, are mostly taught to remember information and regurgitate information. And even when we do tests, it's all about testing what you've remembered rather than what you think and your opinions and how you solve problems. And I think that's something that really needs to change. And I think education is something that needs to be disrupted. Um, I would love for my next project to be on either food or education, because I think those two areas that I'm super passionate about, but critical thinking, problem solving, remember those things, the more you develop those skill sets, the more you can pretty much get any job you want in the world, let alone marketing. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. I try not to talk too much and have a monologue without giving you guys some value. So I would love to take some questions and um, yeah, just have a chat in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, I echo that. Uh, I'm so Chinese, uh, like, uh, culture, culture, culture is very important. Yeah, to understand that culture, I agree with you on this 嗯，我想问一下 ，What are your your client? Are they all make the major clients? Are they in the outside of the China and they want to get into the China market? Uh, yeah. So our biggest clients are right now are probably in. We have a quite a few product technology product clients. Uh, we're launching. Uh, health and fitness, so fashion. We're launching a yoga, a, a clothing brand called Viore. Uh, they're an American brand and they sell them in Harrods. It's kind of like Lululemon, but a little bit more expensive, a little bit more, um, little bit more niche. And they're trying to launch into China. Uh, we have a tech brand called Loop. Uh, it's like earbuds and we're trying to launch them into China as well. I think it's a European brand. Um, we're also working with brands that are coming out of China now trying to globalize. Ever since the pandemic, we've realized there's a shift in our clients. It's less now brands into China, more Chinese brands leaving China and globalizing, which is really cool to see actually, because it means we get more Chinese brands around the world. So we're doing a lot of work with Tencent, I mentioned earlier, mostly about helping them to improve their corporate image around the world. So we're doing like tech for good, on TikTok, we're building them an online publication similar to Dow Insights about Chinese technology and Chinese tech companies, Chinese innovation, in, or in English. Uh, we are working with Alipay again on TikTok to help, just help people to understand what Alipay is and what the innovation technologies are there. So those are the ones I can think of right now. Uh, also, we're working with uh, uh, a L'Oreal brand to help them to optimize their creative in China uh, on, I think is a brand called Biotherm and a few others that I can't remember right now. But we have a lot of clients in travel destination, in beauty, in technology, in B2B increasingly. Um, and those are kind of finance, those are kind of our main, main client sectors, I guess. Okay. So if the brand want to get into the China market, what distribution channel, what platform normally do you use to promote them? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we're doing a lot on Douyin right now. Uh, I'm really big on Douyin. I think it's the best platform by far for brand awareness. To be able to upload a video with no followers and get like five million views the next day if the video is really good, it's like it's like it's like you're cheating the game. It's just incredible. I just can't believe that happens, and I still can't believe that happens. So we always try to steer brands towards Douyin if they want to build awareness, like brand build mass brand awareness. If they want to build conversions and lead and sales, I think WeChat is still very strong. Little Red Book is very strong for female-focused brands. Um, those are probably the main platform we work on. We're mostly a creative content agency, so we do a lot of content, we do a lot of creative, uh, and we do some strategy around business branding, around business strategy in China. Um, so yeah, because we're a content agency, most of those channels are the ones we work with the most. Okay, so <clears throat> when we promote for the brand, do you use their own account? You just provide the content for them. Yeah, so we would generally the brands we work with, we set them up in China from scratch, so they don't have any presence, they don't have any accounts. So we would literally launch their account in China. So, for example, for a brand like Viore, we would launch them a health and fitness account, talking about, and we do all the research of the audience, what kind of audience they have, what the big idea is, and I think at the moment the big idea. I think I'm spoiling this a little bit. I hope the clients aren't watching. The big idea right now is live balance. So it's like a tagline, right? Like Nike, just do it, or Adidas, impossible is nothing. You always have a big idea that drives the emotional triggers, and then you have the strategy and the content pillars that drives the rational triggers so everything we do normally builds into one big idea but it has those different content pillars uh and then that's how we that's basically how we create content we use uh creators to build content in those specific pillars and we try to create an account for them that is filled with their future customers, their audience. But instead of selling the product, we just build the community of like-minded people who will potentially buy the product. And then once we have the big community, that's when we start to focus a bit more on conversion. So it's always about building awareness first and community first. And that's what we do best: is building brand, building communities, and building awareness. And then we convert them into customers. Okay, thank you. And. Um, for quite a lot, quite a lot of the Western uh, seven seven, you see, remember? <laughs> uh, hello, uh, thanks. On the uh, so my my first question is, um, course, as we know, uh, your plan for is a dig digital creative agency. So, except the digital uh, platform, did you like serve some traditional marketing services? like for example outdoor advertising or pr talent endorsements or even the sponsorship uh that's a good question we actually the short answer is no we don't really do anything offline we have partners that can do events mm -hmm. and we do a bit of pr but it's mostly digital pr mm -hmm. uh outdoor advertising we, we basically don't touch that again we have a partner that can do it mm -hmm. but Again, we're focused as a digital content agency. So it's mostly creative content, community building, awareness building. Uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty much a digital agency. So, so like in the future, so your strategy is uh, also only focus on the digital or you will like device your services and expand more services for the brand? No, I think we'll only focus on digital just because I'm addicted mm -hmm. to technology and digital. Um, and I think it takes a completely different business to become a PR firm or to mm -hmm. do outdoor out home advertising or magazine advertising. It's for me, it's, it's a very different business model and I know nothing about it. And I don't, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't want to stretch ourselves too thin as a business and just keep focusing on digital. Okay. Uh, th thank you. So my second question is uh, uh, like uh, you you like provide the services, including the strategy planning, 
activation evaluation. That's a whole package or only help client to uh, activate the di digital side? It's a good question. Um, we generally, um, it's difficult because clients do want different things, right? So, and we try to take tailor to clients as much as possible. Uh, the short answer is, yeah, we do, we do tailor our packages depending on what the client's requirements are. So sometimes the clients will have an account already existing on a social media platform and they're like, it's not performing. So in that case, we'll come in and do an audit of the account and we'll show them the opportunity they can have. Uh, if they came to us, we'll obviously charge them for that. Um, sometimes the clients are like, we don't have an account at all and we need you to start from scratch. Those are actually the best clients normally because they trust us and they give us the opportunity to be creative and do what we want to do. Mm. And there's a saying in marketing, good client, great clients, great work. And it's so true. If you have shit clients that don't trust you and don't give you the opportunity to do what you want to do, you will never do great work. Um, but if you have clients that 100% trust you and say, look, we're output focus rather than input focus. So as long as you're delivering great results, you can do whatever you want. Um, and that's important as well. If any of you guys go work on the client side and hire an agency, make sure you're output focus, right? Rather than input focus. It shouldn't really matter what the agency does. What matters is, is the results that agency achieve from what they do. And that's all about being output focus. I think it's super important. Um, yeah, so we try to tailor to clients, but we also try to really do work that we think we can do a great job on. So I don't think we say no enough. Um, maybe in the future more because we're still quite a small business, but yeah. the power of saying no is also so important as well. Yeah. So, sometimes only like the big company always provide like the whole system of the services, but yeah. sometimes small company, it's better to focus on one thing. Exactly. You're hundred yeah. percent right. And that's what we try to focus. We realized that we used to do a lot and we used to do, try to do everything mm -hmm. and they made us a weaker business. But ever since we started focusing more on content, community, and social, we started to get more clients, do better work, and win more awards. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my last question is, uh, you mentioned uh, your one team influencer. Yes, one uh, team. So in the future, so you, you just like take it as a like influencer channel or like the digital media channel or... Will you like to recruit more influencer or uh, cultivate more influencer from like little baby to adult? So uh, what's your opinion on yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I'm smiling because we do actually have a vision for 1T Media and it's not mm -hmm. about being an influencer. The reason that we started that channel is because we want to eventually create... Okay, so the whole thing, everything we do is about, about opening the world to China. That's our mm -hmm. mission for every part of the business. It's mm -hmm. about helping... Western people to understand Chinese people and cultures fundamentally. Mm -hmm. um, and 1T started by doing that. World Microphone is about helping Chinese people to understand global cultures or helping Western people to understand Chinese cultures. And eventually we want to be a legitimate media business in the sense that we're producing broadcast quality content for the likes of BBC, HBO, Documentary mm -hmm. Channel, History Channel. So what we're doing now is step one of like a million steps. So we're doing influencer short form video channels first to get traction. Then we'll do, we're actually about to launch a YouTube channel very, very soon. So keep an eye out for that. It's going to be really cool. It will be our first show. Uh, and then we'll next step, we'll start pitching to people like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Like I would love to eventually do a documentary about the untold stories of Chinese street food, right? Not about the food, mm -hmm. more about the people, like why they cook the food, why in the South they have different street food to the now North or uh, why they've been doing this for generations. What does it mean to their family? What does it mean to their customers? It's kind of like, I think there's a show on Netflix already that goes around the world. I think it's called Street Food. Um, similar to that, but more focusing on different regions of China. Kind of like Shijian Zhang Zhongguo, but mm. less Chinese and more accessible. I, I think Shijian Zhang Zhongguo is one of my favorite shows, by the way. But mm. I think it's very hard for Western people to understand that show because you need basic fundamental cultural knowledge of China to understand and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So we want to bridge that gap. We want to create shows that are both authentic, but also accessible and bringing Western people into Chinese culture or vice versa. Yes, yeah, agree, agree. So yeah, so if you need like a volunteer to shooting some <laughs> sport related content, I can be the volunteer. I'm we do. A, 
We do. I'm a, <laughs> I, I used to be a footballer. I also a uh, football freestyle. If you need some people play some trick with football and shoot some video contents, I can be the volunteer. Definitely, I would love to. <laughs> we would love will, to play a sports. I will channel. show my link to you later. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, WeChat me, please, and yeah. let's let's talk. We would love to create some Thank sports you. content. Actually, I think. Sorry, guys. The, the the last the last sentence <laughs> is that uh, I work for the sports sponsorship company. So maybe we can have a cooperator, just like you said. You always work the the third party agency. So we work with the Neymar, um, Real Madrid, and the Ryan Garros, or many football player or even sports talent. So if you need some that kind of resource, we can talk. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. I have some other ideas about the football industry, but it's okay. We yeah, we can talk later yeah. offline. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry, guys. Thank you, thank you Seven. <laughs> no, no worries. By the way, Seven is going to give us a talk presentation maybe in in March. It's coming soon. <laughs> okay, next one is uh, Tian He. Yeah. Thank you, Arnold, for the fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it, especially knowing how you turned the pandemic challenge to a total opportunity. That's quite fascinating. So uh, my question, I also have three, but uh, if it's taking too long, feel free to cut me off. So. Um, because I come from technology consulting background, so actually I'm quite strong on the tech side and data analytics. And but I'm actually a quite, um, I have a strong interest in creative because when I was little, wow. I started to do creative writing and that has just always been my hobby. So after coming to the UK for my master's, I really want to combine them to my future career, which is why I think marketing is the direction for me to go. Um, so however, coming from a more to b side, I'm quite interested to know when you're dealing with two C projects, Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty because you're not sure how the market would respond to your campaign. Uh, so all these kind of unpredictable factors would be sort of occur in your project planning and stage. How do you handle these kind of uncertainties, uh, both as a project management uh, thing, but also as a, I don't know, individually, do you feel frustrated if your campaign do not turn out as you expect it to be? So. I would appreciate your insight on this. Yeah, uh, wow, that's a tough question. So uh, I actually think B2, are you talking about B, B2C versus B2B, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually think B2C is much easier uh, generally because it's the channels that you're able to reach people, I think is a lot more readily available. We can create content on B2B, you've got to be very specific and very niche. The messaging is also very difficult normally for B2B campaigns. Uh, your question about uncertainty, I think, yeah, like we always have anxiety of what happens if our campaign doesn't work, what happens if this concept doesn't work. But that's why we always make sure before we run any campaign, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of clients' money and a lot of effort on making sure we understand the audience and the market and we specifically do, and I don't think anyone really does this, we specifically research subcultures very heavily. So for example, when we did a campaign for Moxie, which is one of Marriott's hotels in China, we researched the food culture in China, like foodies, hip hop, rap, um, dance, um, and then finally gaming. And we researched what these people do, what kind of content they like. Basically we learn everything about everyone everything about every one of these subcultures and in the end we worked out gaming was the best one because we felt like we could create content that would resonate with people we felt like there's a gap in the market for creating a really strong gaming account that could build a community of gamers and then eventually turn them into customers for Marriott and for moxie hotel and we honestly probably spent about 25 percent of the budget just on research insights and strategy and creative and then the rest is on execution so I guess our, the way we do things, and it could be different for others, is we, we put a lot of emphasis on the initial start of the campaign. Like if a client said to us, we just want you to come in and do some content, we would say, no, we can't do that because we're not going to be successful. And like you said, we can't manage the risk if we don't understand what the market is like. So yeah, that's what we do. We just over-prepare, over-research, basically. 
Thank you very much. And uh, actually, the, your answer is very related to my second question. So I want to know for the initial planning part, the strategy part, what role would that be in your company? And what sort of criteria are you looking at when you're viewing the application? Because I definitely want to apply. Oh, actually, first of all, your English is really good, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure your Chinese is way better than mine. So the people we have in the initial part, the planning and strategy part, are kind of like three different roles. One is insights and strategy. Sorry, one is insight and research, where people just do loads of desk research or try to understand exactly what certain audiences trigger points are, whether it's emotionally or, uh, or I don't know, tangibly or just basically understanding the audience. And that's actually really important because again, you've got to be a fan of people. You've got to understand what the cultural tensions are. So understanding the difference between Gen Z's and millennials or between millennials and their parents, i.e. baby boomers, is super important because when you understand the culture, cultural tension, that's when you can really create big ideas. Um, I want to give you an example. So, for example, uh, in our generation, or rather in your generation, kind of like Gen Z slash millennials, um, people focus more on individuality, more on individuals, uh, because mainly because our generation has never really experienced the quite poor China, right? Like, we've always had a really good life. We have whatever we wanted. We might struggle, but it's not like the previous generation that went through, like, the cultural revolution or famine where they literally placed all of their success on their kids right so they sacrifice their life so the next generation can be successful and look after them when they're older and also have a better life as well we don't have to do that we don't have to rely our success on our kids because we already have it we have the opportunity so the cultural tension there is that our generation are more individual and more focused on self and pre generation is more collective more focused on the family and from that, you can create a big idea that will, that will, that will resonate with the audience that you're trying to speak to. Um, so that's the first part, insights and research. The second part is really understanding, uh, is creative, basically, is understanding that tension and come out with a tagline. Uh, so for Maria, we use, it, we use a tagline, where brave starts. It's about, uh, it's playing that tension and saying to Gen Z and millennials that, you know, you're, you're now embarking on jobs that didn't even exist like 20 years ago. Like a gamer is not a job 10 years ago. Uh, a photographer, an artist, an illustrator, these weren't jobs like not long ago, right? So these guys are being brave. They're doing things for the first time. And that's a big idea where brave starts. It creates that emotional trigger for the audience. Creative, that's the second role very hard like i'm not a creative guy but I, I i i don't understand how these people think but they come up with amazing things um and the final part is very logic focused is strategy so once we have the big idea how do we it's like researching the content pillars that in gaming that lead up to where brave starts so it could be uh it's kind of looking at existing content what's successful what works creating the pillars and then creating a strategy of how to amplify the content using media spend, using ad spend, um, optimizing the content. It's very kind of like numbers and logic based. Those are the three main roles, basically. Thank you, that's really clear. Uh, just a slight uh, follow up on the insights role. How much do you say that's uh, primary research versus secondary? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know if I can answer that. I'd say probably 50-50, I guess. Um, yeah, it's not, it's actually not something that I'm very, <laughs> very familiar with, honestly. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I do have one more, but That's I think I'm taking a long time. So maybe I wait for others. And if there's more time, ask. The no next worries, one. take your thank time. Thank you so much. Uh, very good um, question. Hey, mm -hmm. sorry, do you mind if I just pop to the loo very quickly? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Let's have a two minutes break. Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Thank you.
哇，天河，好厉害啊！嗯，你的问题非常专业。感谢感谢感谢组织，第一次参加活动很开心，有收益吗？很有收获。嗯，对，我今天就报名、嗯、<笑>入会。那就对了，那就对了。你可以问那个面试的问题都在这里提问了。对啊对啊对啊，就七挺啊。老大，我们有机会去他公司参观一下吗？哦，这个主意不错，这个主意。让雨杰来安排，好吧？哎 ，Mi r a n d a 是他们公司的时候 m i r a n d a 你可以开一下摄像头，大家认识一下。好，你好，大家好，等一下，我弄一下。嗯。我一不小心小窗画了那个镜头，我现在有点找不到那个。Zoom 在哪里？等一下，不好意思。大家可以看到我吗？哎，看到看到，明安德你好，哎，终于可以认识了。哈哈，哈哈，哈哈，哎，阿伦 ，We are we are just talking about the idea of visiting your company. Is that possible?、Sure. Of course, of course. You're welcome anytime. Okay, you just <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> continue to bother you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's no bother. It's a pleasure. Oh, thank, thank you. you、so、Appreciate、much. it. Yeah.、Uh, the next, uh, next one is Ke Ke Mi, Ke Long, Ke Long Mi. Okay, it's my turn. I think I think maybe first I need to do the self introduction. You know, I'm the graduate student from University of Exeter, and my program is engineering. But you know that in the future I want to do the international business and also the cross cultural communication. And、uh, I have some questions for. Uh, Arnold, and I think the first one is that because I have mentioned, uh, on the LinkedIn, I think that you are hiring the project manager for your company. We were, but I don't think we are anymore. Yeah, I think we changed the direction for that role. Actually, maybe if I remember correctly. Yeah, I know that. So. Do you know that the project manager, or do you know that what is the good skills of to being the project a good project manager? Yes, I can answer this question easily. Um, first of all, what kind of engineering you studying? Is electronic systems or? Uh, my bachelor degree is electric and electronic, but I don't want to do it anymore. But I so I change it to engineering business management. Okay, because I studied ESC, Electronic Systems Engineering. I think I loved it. I think it was fantastic. I learned a lot.、Um, but anyway, so project management is very simple. You just gotta be super organized, like super super organized. As in, if you see something that's not organized, it's gonna really piss you off and make you angry. And that's really organization, attention to detail, are really the only two things that matter the most with project managers.、Um, The ability to kind of like take a complex thing and simplify it is super important as well. So, taking like a really complex project or a really complex problem and turning that into something that's step by step, like bullet points,、uh, like、um, like a list of things that needs to be done in order to finish something, it would make a fantastic project manager. But actually, the ability to do that—that's. I guess I'm now talking more about problem-solving ability. If you can do that, you can pretty much do anything you want in life. If you can take a complex problem and simplify it, and turn it into a step-by-step -step process to reach the goal, you you can basically do anything you want.、Um, but specifically as a project manager, you would yeah you would do very well. So you know that you mean currently you you currently didn't need any project manager anymore. You didn't need it. Yeah, I don't think we're hiring for project manager anymore. Actually,、um, I think we were going to, but then we changed our direction, and I think we're now focusing a lot more on client service people. So the the departments we're hiring in is one client services, so account directors, account managers,、uh, 
um, strategists. So uh, those are the people that work with the account managers of the three areas I mentioned earlier. Um, we're looking for content editors, content creators, both on video side and also on writing side. So writing copy for Dow Insights, uh, researching journalism, uh, what else are we hiring? Those are kind of the main, oh, sorry, designers, uh, art directors, we're also looking for. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. Those departments are the ones that we're hiring for the most at the moment. So the, what about the researching analysis to just like to... No, we don't really have roles for research and analysts specifically, but they kind of like fall into the remake of a strategist. Normally a strategist would do that as well as the strategy. So insights, research, and also strategic thinking as well. Okay. And I want to uh, ask something about, maybe it switches off the point, but I want to ask that if when you uh, first name in graduate from university, how do you find, you know, find your love job of, about how do you make your career plan? Just like, because you have mentioned you have changed a lot yeah. and finally you choose to, you know, set up your own business, but you actually, maybe in Chinese, we call it maybe to some degree, some people will think that it's all her no one know yes, because initially, so finally you find that you love. Something yeah, yeah. To I, I, I was actually quite lucky. I knew from a very young age, like when I, even when I was in university or before university, I wanted to work in marketing. Um, also about culture? Yeah, yeah. So I loved, I, I mentioned I loved creative, I loved creative, I loved technology. Uh, it was less about culture back then. It was more about a combination of creative and technology that I really loved. So which is why I studied electronic system engineering at uni and I really enjoyed it. So I was quite lucky that I always knew what I wanted to do. Um, if you don't know what you want to do, and I, which is okay, like I think a lot of people still don't know what they want to do. Uh, that's fine. I would just uh, I would just suggest you try as many things as possible. Uh, and the best way to try things is not actually to get a job in those industries. It's just pick up as a hobby. Because if you can do it as a hobby, then you would be you would you would succeed at that specific thing as your profession you gotta love it i know it sounds super cheesy but if you don't love what you do you're never yeah. gonna, you're never going to be great at it so i the reason i go into marketing is because when i was young i did it as a hobby and then eventually i realized actually i'm pretty fucking good at this so i'm just gonna do it as a job and I also enjoy it so and it's the same for other people in our business like the video people love making video they love creating content the strategists love thinking about problems and solving problems. The designers are really great at designing fantastic visuals. And the clients people are really great with people. They're just really nice people and really great to be around. So you got to love what you do. And I think if you don't know it, uh, find a hobby, like do it as a hobby first and then see if you can enjoy it personally without being paid for it. <laughs> yeah. And also I want to ask a question because you are, Currently, just like you as a manager of the company, and I think that's reflective reflection ability and reanalysis ability is very important. Just like you, when you make some mistakes, and when you look back, that I will take notes every day and I learn from the mistakes. Yeah, you I, think I love that. It's super important. I've made so many mistakes. Some of the biggest mistakes I've made. I've learned the most from the more painful the mistake is the better it is and the more you learn from it when the mistake isn't so painful and you recover from it you will make that mistake again I don't know about you guys but I will make that mistake again so unless it hurts me I'll just keep making that mistake and then when it hurts so bad that I really don't want this to happen again that's when I learn lesson from it <laughs> so mistakes are fantastic um <laughs> Yeah, and also it's very interesting, you know, that because I'm just uh, came, uh, came to England in 2020. So I'm just, you know, in England for ha one year and a half. And, and you know, it's very interesting that I I, I have uh, experienced as a different education system from British and Chinese education system. And also the personal development, because, you know, that 
if you choose to work in 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 the China in China or work in Britain is totally different. Yeah. Uh, also on the atmosphere, the custom, and I want to know that how do you know that how to make a very uh always you know the development for yourself because you know that when you graduate from university maybe i graduated from university last year and you know that we have how do you know that? how to stand out because in china you know that for the large population but limited resources everyone is very strong everyone works very hard yeah yeah so how course. should we you know stand out you uh, sorry, the, 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 maybe way. this is uh, the last question for for you. Then we leave some time for other people. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I'll try and keep it short. But the the way I do things is I always try to, and this is why we started. We keep changing and starting new business models. Stuff like Dow Insights or One T or Six Six Six. Whenever I get, whenever I feel like my job is easy and it gets super comfortable, that's when I'm like, shit's got to change because that's when you stop growing. And if you guys, you guys do running, right? You know, when it's, when you're, when you're running and when it's easy, you're not running fast enough or you're not running long enough. When you go to the gym, when it doesn't hurt, you're probably not working hard enough or you're not lifting it heavy enough. So I always just try to keep change things up whenever I get comfortable and I feel like my job is getting easy the company is kind of like in a good position. I just change everything up completely. And, and, and then shit gets really hard. And then you start to learn and you make loads of mistakes and you learn more and you develop. That's really the only way to grow. Um, short answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think so, the next yeah. one is me. <laughs> hey, I know. Um, I'm really curious about actually, I saw your, um, LinkedIn every day and uh, I feel you. like you, you're always full of energy you post uh, these videos you update your uh, LinkedIn stories uh, your, your cover page quite often I'm really curious about like how can you manage your time so well uh, this is the first question yeah uh, okay so I'm gonna be really honest with you guys um, I have someone helping me to run my LinkedIn full-time basically uh, <laughs> we have conversations twice a week about the kind of posts we want to do, about the ideas, about how I think about how, what my opinion is on certain subjects and news items. And uh, Demetra is the one who does it. She's absolutely awesome. She's super smart, super intelligent. And she will we'll have these conversations. We bounce ideas of each other. And then she helps me to create the posts, um, which goes live on my account. But don't tell anyone. <laughs> but you know, at least I, but even you told me, oh, uh, Dimitri or someone help you to do these things. I still, I, I can see your faces, like you shoot these videos and you show people about like lots of uh, ideas. I think you still do lots of works behind that. And well, my second question is about uh, like uh, how to manage a team so good. Because I think like sometimes when I'm working for myself with my uh, partners, it, it, it's quite how do you say working quite efficient, efficiently, but uh, like when we want to hire some people to help us to do something, it's, it seems like really hard to, um, you know what I mean? Like, I know exactly what you mean. to encourage mean. them. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. It's like, it feels like you're trying to draw blood out of a stone, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so do you have some secrets? Can you share a bit? I do, I do. I have one secret and the secret is just hire great people. Um, <laughs> the, the, the answer is harder. It sounds easy, but it's actually super difficult. So and they are expensive. The, uh, yeah, they can be expensive. It depends what kind of people you go for. You can either go mm -hmm. for people that have a lot of experience, which is really expensive, or you can go yeah. for people who are really smart and mm -hmm. don't have much experience, which is not as expensive. But you got to make sure those people that don't have experience have critical thinking and problem solving abilities and they're passionate about what they do. And really like most people that I've worked with recently that have become part of the leadership team or that I've seen develop a lot are people who are just fucking smart. Like this is really <laughs> clever. They can solve they can solve problems. Like you, you tell them something once and yeah. they're like, okay, I completely get it. 
uh, and we we test people when we hire people most people will give like a um a logic test uh and it's it's very simple you don't have to prepare for it we'll we'll give them a set of data about a client so for example like this client pays us 5000 a month and the cost to deliver the work is 3000 a month tell us what the profit and loss sheet is uh and then like i'm simplifying it it's a little bit more complicated than that the actual test but it just tests the ability to a process data attention to details mm -hmm. understand what they're reading and b turning that into something that is simple and easy to understand for whoever's reading it so that 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 skill set to process data is yeah. probably the best way to test how well someone can work in a business environment um yeah that's kind of my advice i guess uh what else what else i'm trying to think what changed uh options so when we're hiring people we never hire someone because they're the only one that's applying for the job because they're the only one that is, can do the job we mm -hmm. only hire people when we have options so we try to have two or three people in the final round of interview and yeah. we just pick the best one because for me again one of my philosophies i live in life is options is power if you don't have options you're forced to make a decision um based on not having options but if you have options you can make a decision you can make a more educated decision based on all the different things you can evaluate and you can see so options is power you gotta have options um what else that's probably it really um just making sure like people problem solving critical thinking mm -hmm. the two things that are so important and i can't stress that enough in the people mm -hmm. that you work with yeah, that, that's amazing. Thank you. Uh, I still have a, a question. It's about like, do sometimes uh, will you feel anxious if you don't receive enough views, likes, or collects? Uh, or I, I mean, like I know uh, should your microphone and other uh, platforms. Uh, I would say like all oh, the accounts are amazing. They got lots of likes. They got a lot of followers. But do you have like some moments? Oh, today and um, this video don't achieve my uh, expectation. What? How do you deal with it? Oh my god! Yeah, all the time. Honestly, like <laughs> on studio microphone, on my LinkedIn account, on TikTok, I it's so it's so anxiety driven. Like social media is actually so bad for your mental health. Because whenever I see something that doesn't get enough content, I'm like, shit, what's wrong with me? Or especially for LinkedIn, like, are we saying stuff that people don't agree with? Are we being mm -hmm. stupid? Um, the only way to deal with it is just to analyze it and find out, look at the content, find out why this is happening compared to previous successful content. So we have like social media tools that basically pulls in all of our LinkedIn posts, uh, analyze the engagement, put them into topics, and Demet again, Demetra does all of this. She'll analyze it and look at what are the successful content. And then she'll come up with topics and then we'll discuss how we wow. can create more of the same. So the more you understand and the more you analyze, the less anxiety you have generally. But yeah, it's completely normal. And I get, I'm actually super fucking anxious all the time. <laughs> I just hide it really well. It's because I'm always anxious. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I guess you will give Demetra more bonus this year. <laughs> Uh, she will. She will. She's getting promoted. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I finished my questions. Thank you for all your um, answers. I I'm quite satisfied with it. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Is it my turn? Okay, finally, it's my turn. I feel today's virtual talk is the uh, most aggressive and intense than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And then maybe because um, Everyone has so many questions. Also, we are speaking English. It's like an interview for everyone, <laughs> which <laughs> makes me so nervous. All right, so um, I have uh, three questions. Um, and so for the first question, maybe I misunderstand or I missed out in your previous speech. Just, um, I just want to re-ask that. You, you mentioned uh, several companies like uh, Qiming, Wanti Media, and 666, uh, and also Dao Insight. So I'm curious, um, are they all separate companies or are they just a uh, project name and under the same company? Hey, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually quite complicated. So 666 is a separate company and it's registered as a separate business. Okay. Uh, One Team Media, Dow Insights and 
are currently just under business units under Cumin. So they're not separate businesses. Um, originally, our group structure is that Cumin is an agency and yeah. that services clients. And then Dow Insights is an online publication. It's independent, technically. Uh, and uh, 1T Media is a media company that's, again, separate from Cumin. Even it doesn't have its own business entity. However, we're going to change that structure a little bit in the sense that we're going to try and um, put most things under the same department. So, so for example, 1T Media would be under the media department at Cumin that services clients as well as does its own media production. Um, Dow Insights will sit under the strategy department that, again, helps clients with strategy and insights as well as managing the publication at the same time. Um, and then 666 is, we'll say, under the social media department that helps clients with their own accounts uh, and also serves as kind of like a flagship for the so social media department. So we're actually trying to consolidate everything and make things easier to understand. But before it was a little, I think a little bit too segmented. Um, it's something that we're still thinking about. It's a really good question though. Thank you. So um, obviously you are the CEO and the founder of all these companies. Um, how about um, teams when it comes to employees? Is uh, employees work for several companies like a shared employee or uh, you own separate team for different companies. Yeah, so again, at the moment, Cumin has its own employees that work on clients. And then we have 1T that does its own influencer channels, but they also help with clients. We have Dow Insights that mostly work on Dow Insights, but also help with clients. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's all a bit complicated, which is why I was thinking earlier, I was saying earlier that we're going to try to merge some of these business units into departments at Cumin. Um, 666, however, is very separate. But then again, at the same time, it's very merged with Cumin because when we get a client for 666, it's a Cumin staff who services the clients. It's just super fucking confusing right now, but <laughs> which is why we need yeah. to clarify the structure a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, we just talk about that. We probably will uh, organize a visit to your office. So is that all the team is in the same office in the uh, same yes. building or, okay. Yeah, we're actually a quite small business. There's only about, I think, 30 people in the office at the moment. Yeah, but you guys manage it very well. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> they are very good, <laughs> the team. <laughs> They're great people. Uh, actually, uh, last time we organized a visit to Made in London. Yeah, Made in London. And then I met one of your employee. I think her name is uh, Fei, Fei Yang. Fei Yang. Yeah. she's great she's really yeah. great yeah fantastic i saw her um uh, her face uh face to face and also on videos all the time yeah so my question is that uh do you think your business is uh share some similarities with uh, made in london very good question i i'm actually not 100 percent sure what made in london does i think they focus mostly on live streaming uh in which case I would say we're very different because we are mostly focused on digital advertising content and marketing rather than live stream production. We don't actually do any live stream at the moment. We might do in the future, but mm. we, don't, we don't do any at the moment. So I would say we're very different unless you also do content, non-live content, advertising and marketing, and then there will be some overlap, but I, I, yeah, I don't know what they do. I, I, I thought they only do live stream. If that's the case, then we're very different. Yeah, I think um, they also, I think um, the same thing is that COVID is also a turning point for them. So mm. they move their business from uh, advertisement to uh, like a live streaming like video. Yeah. It's a very um, smart move, actually. I respect that. Yeah. So, uh, I think, uh, is there any people from TikTok to reach out to you? Because from my own pers uh, personal perspective, I feel like your company uh, is a very good platform to do live streaming. <laughs> we, um, we have talked to people before, but uh, yeah, I'm just, I don't know. Maybe, maybe in the future, who knows? Who knows, right? Never yeah, say anything. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm just curious because um, the company I'm working for right now is just a very small company, and actually we are mainly focus on international trading. We do trading business, but still, uh, some personnel from TikTok they reach out to us to say, "Do you do the agency like organize live streaming like what Made in London do?" So I guess they will invest a lot on this aspect. Yeah, so I'm just oh, ah, interesting, interesting. Okay, maybe we can have a chat after. Okay, sure. And、uh, okay, so let's move on to my third question. Um, so I understand that you and、um, you. You you serve you provide service to some brands and merchants to help them either uh, uh English I mean British brand to to China or help a Chinese brand to、uh, to do marketing in UK. So um I would like to know how how is the service uh will be charged. So but if if it's like about a commercial secret, just you can refuse to answer. So is no, it like、uh, is it like、uh, you charge monthly fee or is it like you charge commission、uh, for the revenue、uh, you create for them through your marketing? It's a very good question. It's no, there's no secret here, and every agency works the same way. We charge people normally based on the amount of time we spend on their work on their projects. So it's same as like a law firm would charge their lawyers by the hour or by the minute sometimes for lawyers. Uh, or an accountancy firm would charge the accountants by the hour, so it's same for us. If we were running a campaign for a client, we would work out what the scope is and who needs to deliver the work. So, let's say a day of creative director's time, two days of designer's time, three days of strategist's time, and then five days per month of the content creator's time. And each person is paid a certain amount, and then each person has a price based on how much they're paid. That's a markup in the business, and then you add it all together. Then you have the fee. It's it doesn't matter if it's project or monthly. It's all about how much time that we need to spend on that client's work.、Mm, okay, that's very interesting to know because I work in a、um, uh, startup company as well, and sometimes、okay. uh, some clients reach out to us. So we have to come up a new idea, new service for them, and、uh, which make me very hard. Uh, to figure out how we should charge them,、so、I'm always curious on the、um, on this aspect. Yeah, I think you can either do it based on the product, or you can do it based on people's time. But time is normally the safe thing because that's a hard cost in the business. You got to make sure when there's a cost, there's a revenue against it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your answers. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. I'm gonna、uh, give the microphone to other people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Zhong Fangxing. Hi, Arnold. <laughs> Sorry.、Uh -huh. Um. So the、um, the main con content of my work is responsible for user growth and and serving and to the market. So I'm a, a familiar with the internet market in China, and I know the operation process of every details of work. So my first question is. I wonder if there are any UK digital companies that want to expand into the Chinese market. What do you mean, digital companies? What kind of digital?、Companies? Or just internet companies like TikTok, Snapchat. Ah,、oh, I see. I would say no, because the last big tech firm. Tech service form LinkedIn just pulled out of China recently, <laughs> so I think they realize that it's it's not impossible, but it's extremely hard to succeed in China unless you're a native homebred tech startup. Because you're there's a couple of reasons. One, they don't really understand Chinese people and cultures. They don't know how Chinese people use the internet. They don't know how to they don't know how to service design for Chinese customers, and that's super important. Um, two, they're fighting against the wind for everything. Like the government don't want them to succeed. Chinese people don't want them to succeed. No one wants them to succeed in China.、Uh, so yeah, I would say, if there were any, I'll probably advise them not to. <laughs> But I don't, I don't think there are any anyway. <laughs> okay. So,、um, is there any difference between the UK's?、Mm -hmm. Internet market and China's, and how can I quickly understand the market and policies here? 
what is yeah like? it's uh mm-hmm. there's a couple of main differences one i think one is that chinese internet market is much more native to mobile uh and that's kind of obvious right but it's kind of obvious and it's kind of not at the same time because most of the apps and most of the big tech platforms we use now, like Facebook, uh, Facebook is a prime example. It was originally developed for desktop internet. Uh, and then they kind of adapted it to the mobile environment. And it's now the biggest app in the Western society. Um, but in China, that doesn't, it doesn't happen. Pretty much all the successful applications were originally developed for mobile devices, whether it's WeChat or or whatever, right? Pretty much anything. It was always native to mobile. I think that's the biggest difference. Uh, the second thing is a lot of Chinese service design firms are very multifaceted uh, and they all try to eat out of each other's food bowl. So Alibaba tries to do content. Douyin tries to do e-commerce. Everyone tries to do everything for everyone, against everyone else. In the West, it's normally very focused. Um, they like do one thing and they just can't really do anything else. Like you can't imagine Amazon doing content. And we see Facebook and Instagram trying to do e-commerce all the time, but they fail all the time because they don't take it seriously enough. They don't invest enough in it. And they're just kind of shit. Uh, I, yeah, I think those two are probably the biggest differences, I guess. Maybe there's more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. my last question. So I, I want to learn some digital marketing courses uh, by myself on online, so which will take me more times. Do you think, um, I wonder if it is beneficial for my future work? Digital marketing courses, yes, definitely. Um, I don't know any good ones though. Uh, let me think. I think, actually, we're... we're <laughs> It's funny you say that. We're actually developing some courses with Peking University right now, Bei Yun Asia. Um, and we're going to be developing some courses around digital marketing, around short form video, around how to build social media channels and optimize them. Um, but that probably won't happen for another several months. Um, anything work? I honestly think the best way to learn is just to try and do it, right? Like I said, when I learned about uh, websites, I literally opened up Notepad and started typing HTML. I just Googled HTML and there's everything available on the internet. When, when we wanted to be better at social media for our clients, we created 1T Media to build our own channels, to create our own content, just so we could learn how to do things. Um, same as SEO. When I wanted to learn SEO when I was younger, I just SEO'd my own website. I think the best way to do things, just honestly, hands on. I, I actually, I, I don't really rate kind of like courses because a lot of the times it's very theoretical and things in the digital landscape change so fast. So any course that gives you hands on opportunity to do something, I think will be really great. But if there's something you want to learn specifically, I think just try and just try and do it if it's possible. It's not always possible, but if it is possible, I think just try and do it. That's probably my worst answer tonight so far. <laughs> I think it can boost my business highly paid job, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think if you really want to get into a highly paid job, it's like demonstrate your ability for critical thinking and problem solving in the interview and yeah, like just have a lot of confidence when you're in an interview. Um, yeah, the, the, that's my best advice because we would hire people that can demonstrate that really well. Yeah, okay, got it. Thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's my turn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for your sharing uh, and also uh, thank you for the, all the questions to put on. So maybe my question is a little bit uh, um, daily life to return your daily life. So I noticed that in your introduction that you mentioned you are a writer, also the presenter, and also to have the fun activity called the Every Asian Wise. So could you to introduce a little bit that? Yeah, actually, um... 
Uh, yeah, so I, I used to write a lot. I don't write much anymore because uh, I'm actually not fantastic at writing. So when I write an article, it would mm. take me like a day that would take a better writer, maybe like half a day or something like that. Uh, so I used to do a lot of article writing on different publications, uh, which I still enjoy doing, but I just don't really have time to do that anymore. Miranda's much better than me at it. Um, the other thing, host, so we used to have a podcast and I used to really enjoy doing that, actually. I don't know why we never started again, because that was something I really enjoyed. And I think it was just really great to host a show about what's happening in China, because it forces me to learn and understand and stay up to date. So I really miss doing that. Um, Every Asian Voice, again, is something we started. Miranda was actually one of the person that started it with us as well at the time. But then again, like life took over. Uh, none of us, I didn't have the time to really commit to it. So that's kind of on pause at the moment. Uh, <laughs> this is probably not the best introduction because I seem to pick up a lot of things and then drop them. However, I think I would actually encourage all of you to do the same thing. Like try mm-hmm. everything and just try and figure out what you're going to be really good at and where you're going to stay passionate about for a long time. And you don't mind spending loads of your time so I always make excuses and I realize this is wrong now. I used to always make excuses and say, I don't have time for writing. I don't have time to make a podcast. I don't have time for every Asian voice. But actually, if you wanted to do something, you always make time. So when yeah, we say totally. we don't have time, when I say I don't have time, I'm generally just making excuses because I just kind of like don't want to do that anymore. So find find something and that's what I was saying earlier if you don't know what you want to do for a living just, just do try. just try loads of different things as a hobby and mm. then that that thing where you find time to do is a thing that I think you'll be really great at when someone pay you to do it okay and also I'm interested in about your daily life in the marketing thing so could you share something about your daily life to doing the your marketing thing or business thing Cause well, that, yeah. When I wake up, I do a hundred press ups first. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't do any press ups. Um, <laughs> I don't. I uh, what? <laughs> what do you mean about marketing things in my daily life? <laughs> I mean about your uh, just like your business thing. And cause the as the one um, person just uh, mentioned that you are really good at to um doing the schedule in your daily life so i want to know about the how could you to um to do your business about to them about your uh, run your um company and also to um communicate to with your different uh, department and also your um oh, bias yeah okay. um i don't know where you heard that but i'm actually really bad at organization that's definitely one of my weak points like if, if, if stuff is not in my calendar, I will completely forget about it. I literally live by my calendar. So I will show up where my calendar tells me to show up. Um, if it's not in there, I, it doesn't exist in my world because I'm, my memory is so bad. My organization is so bad. So the way I try to make that happen is that every time I commit to something, I put it in my calendar and make sure it gets done. Um, I generally actually don't really get involved too much with the day-to-day of execution for different business units or the company because I believe the best time I can spend is focusing on the people in the business. So I try to give people time to help them to solve problems. Uh, Most of the time that I spend now is hiring people. So going through CVs, doing first interview, screening people, setting tests, talking to them. That's like half of my time now probably spent doing that. And the other half of my time is meeting different people in department, different departments. Uh, and then finally, the third half, I know it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the third half of my time is coming up with different ideas on how we can improve the business uh, and what like the different business units like Wanty Media or Dow Insights and all of these things. Uh, and of course, finding the people that can actually do it because um, I'm not good enough to normally execute those things. Okay, so as I just uh, have the, some uh, um, observation about the, I think that uh, maybe the one reason you get your dark circles of your eye that is due to the writing, <laughs> but maybe not. Probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably lack of sleep. 
<laughs> yeah, and I also uh, uh, want to know about the recently, what's your hobbies? Ah, yeah, okay. So this is a good one. Um, hobbies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is it honestly, hard to answer? <laughs> I honestly don't really have that many hobbies. Um, I love cars. Um, mm. I try to go to the gym as much as I can because I think it's important to exercise and have a healthy body and a healthy mind. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I play games. <laughs> yeah, good. And also probably I can suggest you to take part in the more hiking activities, the, which is the, yeah, which is a club we all organize. Yeah. Oh, really? You guys do hiking as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. join us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Like in what, like in a, like a, a outside of London or something, I'm guessing. Yeah, around London. Wow. Yeah. We I sometimes, I sometimes yeah. Peak District. Yeah, let me know. Oh, Peak District. I've never been there. That's so cool. Really? I will organize one then. <laughs> Definitely. Let me know. I would love to do that. Because I yeah. live in Nottingham. I don't live in uh, London. So oh, you're not in London. Okay. Yeah, neither do I. I live in Liverpool now. Yeah. But you can. You're not in London as well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is so uh such a very diverse crowd <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so that is a very the uh, the fabulous moment and to gather people online to have this meeting yeah yeah it's cool it's nice and uh, yeah and also hopefully you and can just uh, to make the balance about your daily life and also your business and then to connect with it yeah yeah you're you're 100 right i think it's important to create a balance um definitely yeah. It can be it can be addictive as well, and you forget like to rest or you forget to like focus on yourself. But yeah, I I, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you so much. And also, here is the something in the chat box. Yeah. Ah yeah. Yeah, I prefer YY to turn on the camera to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's more personal. I don't like to ask question on the chat. <laughs> Bye bye. You know them. Them, it's my turn. I don't have time to ask question now. I have, I have two questions. <laughs> when we do the marketing, we try to be very creative. But uh, sometimes you have some bottom line. Bottom line, you might hurt the brand. You know the the some. Famous Western brand, they made joke about the China culture, but the, which made the Chinese people very angry about the brand. <laughs> yeah, when, I know. When, when, when the, what's the bottom line that is uh, definitely you can't touch? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. So I think the bottom line is uh, <laughs> the bottom line is creating satire around Chinese people and culture. Uh, and that's exactly what Dolce & Gabbana did. They tried to be satirical and rebellious, but instead of about their own culture in the West or in Italy or in England or in Europe, they tried to do it to Chinese culture, which is absolutely fucking stupid because you can't make fun of someone else. You can make fun of yourself and that's okay, right? But you can't make fun of someone else. More importantly, you can't make fun of someone you don't understand. And that I think that's a fundamental mistake they made. They felt that, because their whole brand in the West is about being rebellious and satirical, that they can get away with it. The founder is an absolute fucking asshole, but everyone loves him for his personality in the West. So they tried to replicate the same thing when they went to China, but they, no one got it. People just don't get it because they, 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 they're, they're an outsider, right? They don't understand it. They don't understand it well enough to make fun of it. Uh, and I think that's the bottom line. If you're gonna if you're gonna do something cultural in China as a foreign brand, be humble. Uh, Apple does this really well. All of their ads are really humble. It's always about respecting Chinese culture and making it look really great and propping it up. Uh, and yeah, just hum humble advertising, I think, is is the best way to like do it if you don't understand it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my second question is: um, you trust people. But when you 
when the people you hire is not is unproductive, <laughs> it's not as good as what you expected. <laughs> what do you do? Oh God. What what's the question? <laughs> so the, when the you have the your people working for you, that is uh, unpro- unproductive. The expectation is not as you you want. What do you do with the, these people? What do I do? What do I do with them? Um, um, okay, so there's a couple of things. First, sometimes, sometimes people just fall out of love with jobs and with what they do, and there's nothing you can do about that. It's not because they're not good enough or they're not smart enough or they're not capable enough. It's because they've lost passion for that specific thing. And when that happens, the best thing to do, there's only two reasons. One, you either try and create another role in the business for them that can re-energize them and bring the passion back. The only other thing is just to mutually agree to part ways to understand that this is a break that they're having and you need to, yeah, you just need to say goodbye to each other friendly and professional. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this, this is- It's, it's actually a very difficult topic, right? Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't want, the, the one thing I would advise is, and this is a mistake I made before, is that you try to hold on to people that are smart, really good, long before, long past their past due date of their passion for the job. And when that happens, they will eventually build resentment and they become toxic to the business, to themselves and to you. So as like a manager or a leader, or even as someone who works in a business, to understand when it's time to leave, it's also super important as well. Uh, No one works in a job their whole lives. It's natural to want to change jobs and to re-energize yourself. So don't, don't stay past your due date and as a, as, a, as a person, and don't try to hold on to people that have lost the passion for whatever they're doing as a manager or as a leader. I learned that the hard way because I tried to hold on to people before and they just became like, they just kept building resentment. They became more and more angry about their role, about the business, became toxic. And that's really bad. But if you said goodbye at the right time, you will say goodbye in the very friendly and professional way that both parties are happy with. And then you hold on to that relationship in the future. Thank you. That's a very good answer. Uh, there's a one question. Eva, how to... Eva. <laughs> Can you read the question? Uh, 请问你是如何让你的客户相信? Oh, how do you compete with a local Chinese uh, marketing agency company? It's a good question. As in marketing agencies in China? Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually very difficult to compete with them because a lot of them have much bigger offices, obviously, in China. Uh, so the way we try to do things is slightly different to what marketing agencies do in China. We normally combine the Western creative process with Chinese insights and Chinese native understanding of platforms, technology, and people. Uh, and a lot of Chinese agencies can't do that because they don't have the experience of, they don't have the understanding and experience of the century old creative process that's been around in New York, in America, in London, in the UK, uh, even Europe to a certain extent. But London and New York are basically the advertising mecca of the world. It's arguably the most advanced marketing agencies, people, strategies, process, just because it's been around for so long. Um, And I think a lot of Chinese agencies still lack the ability to create emotional driven irrational creative and really strong ideas that move people and make people feel something i think chinese agencies are generally very good at execution and tactics and even strategy to a certain extent it's a creative where they're weak and i think there's a reason for that the reason is 
a lot of Chinese brands have traditionally succeeded by focusing on just expanding, having footprint and having reach and just being fucking everywhere in China. Uh, and they focus more on distribution and sales and less on building a brand that makes people, that last generations, right? And you look at like Unilever and PNG, these guys are fucking so good at building brands that you're still buying the same shit that your mom is buying, right? And, 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 and you, you can't do that by just selling and just by expanding your footprint. You do that by like Dove or like uh, whatever, Persil, like all of these things, all of their marketing is around being part of people's lives, like showing, like it's all about, it's all the emotional stuff, like washing, like um, it's simple about removing stain from clothing, but it's not because it's around like raising your kids and then when your kids grow up, their memory is their mom, you know, washing their clothes with this brand. And then they do it to their kids. And then it becomes a generational thing rather than just like, I'm going to the shop and buy the cheapest detergent. Um, I think that emotional part is something that a lot of Chinese agency lack because Chinese brands haven't had, haven't had to do that. Um, but I think they'll change in the next 20 years because as the market gets saturated, like it has in the West, you have to start focusing on brands and building emotional connection rather than just competing on product or price or distribution or sales. Thank you. I believe Eva is happy with your answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I learned a lot from tonight. I, I'm sure everyone agree. You will agree you turn on the camera. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very lame relate uh, tonight so we want to say thank you to you i get no uh, thank you for 20, having me <laughs> 20 really seconds do everyone do turn on the camera <laughs> some shy but, people it's okay <laughs> <laughs> we, we will meet you meet your office soon uh, i'm looking forward to that okay. yeah sure welcome anytime <laughs> let's uh let's talk offline we can arrange it thank you so much thank well, you yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.